Islamic Audio Bites. Roz Khan will be continuing to read The Tree of Being by Ibn Arabi, which can be accessed at sirotoday.org. Let's read. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. His eating and drinking. He liked to drink cool and sweet drinks, and among these, he liked best water sweetened with honey. He also liked milk. When he drank, he would breathe before swallowing and say, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. After each swallow, he would say, Alhamdulillah. He would take only two or three swallows in this way. He had a glass cup from which he drank. He liked to drink water from its source. Sometimes he would send people to particular wells, springs and fountains where there was good water and he would pray for the people who brought the water to him. He would drink Zamzam water each time he went to Mecca. He would carry it himself or ask his people to bring it to him. He liked to sit and watch running water and greenery. He kept his water in covered containers. He ate little, and if he ate in the evening, he wouldn't eat in the morning. He ate only when he was hungry and stopped eating before he was full. He fasted often. In addition to the month of Ramadan, the month in which he fasted the most was Shaban, the ninth of Dhul-Hijjah, the day of Ashura, the first three days and the first Monday, of each month he passed fasting. It was rare if he did not fast on Fridays. Sometimes to appease his hunger, pangs, he would tie a flat stone against his stomach. Sometimes he would fast for days without breaking the fast, but he would forbid others to do that. He never kept anything for tomorrow. Sometimes neither he nor his family had anything to eat for days. They often ate barley bread. When he broke his fast at sunset, he would first eat a date or two, or drink water before he made his sunset prayer. When he ate, he sat on the floor and set his food on the floor. He never leaned on anything while he ate. He washed his hands well before and after eating. He started the meal by saying Bismillah. He ate with three fingers of his right hand. He ate what was on the side of his plate. He never reached for a morsel in the middle of the plate. He did not approve when other people who ate with him from the same plate did it. He did not start eating a warm dish until it cooled. In fact, he did not like warm dishes. He said, eat cold food because it has the blessing of abundance. If you are heedful, you will see how much more you must eat when you eat warm food. He never blew on food to cool it, nor did he blow into his cup when he drank. He liked to break his fast with fresh dates or something fire had not touched. He liked dates. He liked to hold them in his hands, attached to their branches in bunches, and eat them one by one. He ate them with bread, with watermelon, with cucumber, with cream, and he would say, what a blessed fruit. Even when there was a worm in a date, he wouldn't throw it away, he would clean the worm out and eat the date. He started his meals with dates and finished them with dates. He liked sweet things. He liked honey and halva, a sweet made with cereals, sesame oil and syrup, and raisins. He ate meat. The meat he preferred was the front part of the sheep, especially the shanks of the front legs. He disliked eating the internal organs of the animal. He refused to eat kidneys, although he did not forbid others from eating them. Among vegetables he liked squash and cucumbers. He disliked onions, garlics, leeks and such things that leave a smell on the breath, for he spoke with angels and did not like to offend other people in congregation. He accepted all invitations to dinner, even from a slave where he may have eaten a stale animal fat with old barley bread. He ate everything that was offered to him if he was hungry. He started eating only after others had started. After each meal, he said, Alhamdulillah, and prayed for his host and the ones who had shared the meal. His sleeping. He went to bed after the night prayer, awoke in the middle of the night to pray, and slept again before the morning prayer. He liked to take an afternoon nap. His eyes slept, but his heart did not sleep. His bed was a piece of felt. Sometimes he used a straw mat thrown on the hard floor, which marked his blessed side when he lay upon it. The mat was not bigger than the size of a grave. Before he went to bed, he would always recite Surah Kathirun and one or more of the following, Surah Mulk, Surah Sajda, Surah Bani Israel, and Surah Zumar. He would not go to bed without taking an ablution and cleaning his teeth. He kept his miswak next to his bed, 
and would use it when he woke up. He slept with his head turned in the direction of the Kaaba. He slept on his right side and used his right hand as a pillow, placing his palm under his cheek. Before he would sleep, he would pray, O my sustainer, I live with your name, I die with your name. Then he would repeat three times, On the day of resurrection, save me from your wrath. He breathed heavily when he slept. His family relations. He loved and cherished his wives. Whether they were young or old, beautiful or less beautiful, he treated them equally. When he got married or performed a wedding ceremony, he distributed dates to the wedding guests. He liked to give gifts and advised his people to do the same. He would say that giving gifts brought people together. He smiled when he spoke and showed care and compassion to the members of his household. He did not touch even the hand of a woman from outside of his family. He would talk to, amuse and play with his wives. He would show them affection, kiss and caress them even when he was fasting. He did not consider his ablution lost as a result. He would make his prayers without renewing his ablution. He divided his time equally among his wives. He was able to visit all of them in a day or a night and satisfy all of them. He would send word to his wife who he was intending to visit. He had a yellow bedsheet dyed with saffron, which was always kept proper and clean. He took this with him to sleep on with his wives. The wife with whom he spent the night would wash and fold it for him. He would take his ablution and say Bismillah. When he came close to his wives, he asked them to recite Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah and Allahu Akbar 33 times each. When they made love, they were careful to keep their sexual parts chastely covered. During intercourse, he usually stood on his knees. They took a total ablution immediately afterwards. Rarely in dire conditions of cold and fatigue, He delayed ablution and slept until before prayer time. He would not sleep with his wives when they had their periods, but he would still show them physical affection. He helped with the household chores. He cleaned, washed, mended and milked the sheep. No work was beneath his dignity. He took his wives out and brought them and his children to special holiday prayers. When he travelled or left for battle, he would not choose one of his wives to accompany him, rather he would let them choose who wished to go, and draw lots to decide who would accompany him. When his wives became ill, he took care of them and cooked soup for them, saying, Drink, this will cleanse the pain and sadness in the heart of the sick, as water cleanses the dirt of a dirty person's body. He would pray for them when they were ill, reciting Surah Falak and Surah Nas three times. When one of his wives was sick with an infectious disease, especially of the eye, he would not go close to her, fearing to infect others. When his wives wanted something, he never said no, but brought them what they wanted as soon as he could. If he was worried about forgetting it, he would tie a string to his little finger or to his ring. He would pray for his wives and sacrifice sheep for them. When they were annoyed, he would be gentle with them. Once, Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, was annoyed. He gently caressed the tip of her nose and called her my little Aisha and asked her to pray so that her anger would subside. He was wonderful with children. He saluted them like grown-ups, talked to them, caressed their heads and hugged them. He would stand up, the gesture of respect, when his daughter Hazrat Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her, came to see him, and he would kiss the top of her head. He always wanted children around him during prayer time at the mosque. His grandchildren would climb on his back while he prayed, and he did not mind. He loved all of his people, but he loved the very young and the very old most of all. His possessions. He possessed little did not keep things long and gave them away. He liked to give names to his belongings. He had a mirror he called Mudala, which meant misleader, and a pair of scissors he called Jami, Unita. He had a water pitcher called Mamshuk, thin and tall, and a sleeping mat called Guz, Shunner of impurity. He had a glass cup and two coal containers. He used to put coal on his eyelids every evening three times from each container. He had a wooden perfume bottle. He always had one new robe which he wore on Fridays. He had one towel. He had a heavy iron basin that it took four people to lift, called Anara, well built, and an iron cooking pot with four rings as handles. He kept a maid named Hadira. When he addressed her, he would ask her, What would you like? He never complained about the service of the ones who served him. He had a donkey named Yafu and he often rode without a saddle. He had two horses, a roan named Mutajas and a black named Sakub. 
He had a mule, Duldul, and a she-camel, Kaswa. He loved and cared for his animals. When he left this world, Kaswa ran away into the desert. Every night she would come to the mosque looking for him, crying and hitting her head on the stone steps. One night she killed herself by hitting her head on the stone wall of the mosque. He had a sword called Dulifigar, with decorated silver handle with a silver ring. He had a bow called Dussadad, and a quiver for his arrows called Duttamam. He had a short spear called Nab'a, and a shield called Zakan. His devotions. He had two moisins who called the prayer five times a day, Hazrat Bilal and Ibn Maktam, who was blind. What he liked best in this world was Salat, the ritual prayer. He made his prayers seeing his Lord. That is why he asked his people to do their prayers as they saw him do it, not as he did them. It would have been impossible for anyone to pray as he did. The people whom he liked most were the people who were constant in their devotion. When he led the prayer, he made it short and easy. When he prayed alone, he made it long. He would stand at night all night until his blessed feet were swollen. When the weather was cold, he prayed early. In the heat of the summer, he delayed his prayers. When he sent someone to a place as a governor or an imam, he would warn them, Speak not long. Long talk has the effect of a sorcerer's spell. Make your preaching short and make things easy for people, not difficult. Give them good tidings, not threats of punishment. He performed his ablution before every prayer. When he made ablution, he would try to conserve water. He would put aside a little and sprinkle it on the place where he would put his head in prostration. When he washed his hands, he would move his rings so the water got under them. When he washed his lower arms up to the elbows, he rubbed them well above them. He would wash and rub his earlobes and then take a handful of water, put it under his chin, rub his beard well and comb it with his fingers. When he washed his feet, he rubbed between his toes with his little finger. He liked to dry his hands and arms after ablution by air rubbing, rather than by drying them with a towel. After the ablution was completed, he used to make two cycles of private prayer before he did his prayers in congregation. He did not permit anyone to assist him when he performed his ablution. He would not let them pour water or even hand him a towel. Neither did he like to ask people to serve him. When he prayed, his colour would change. Sometimes he would grow pale and sometimes he would flush. At the time of the morning prayer, the maids of the people of Medina would come to the mosque with water pitchers. He would dip his fingers in the pitchers and bless them. After finishing the morning prayer, he would sit and offer private prayers with his face turned towards the Kaaba until sunrise. Then he would turn to the congregation and say, If anyone is sick, let me go and visit him. If anyone is dead, let me assist at his funeral. If anyone has dreamed, let him come and tell me his dream. When he stood up to pray, he would raise his hands, open his fingers with his palms facing forward and say, Allahu Akbar. And then he would lower his hands and hold his left hand with his right hand. When he bent from the waist in prayer, he would place his hands with open fingers right above his knees. His back would be so straight that if you poured water on it, it would remain there and not run off. Nothing prevented him from praying, nor from doing so at the proper time. When he travelled, however, he would make the Salat of noon and afternoon together at the time of afternoon prayer, and he made the evening prayer and the night Salat together at the time of night prayer. In fact, he was in constant prayer, for he never forgot Allah, but remembered him at each breath. He liked to pray in gardens and open spaces. He usually prayed on a treated sheepskin or a straw mat. He usually took off his shoes when he prayed, but sometimes he kept them on. He would make extra prayers between the afternoon and evening times, but forbade others to do so. He would do two cycles of private prayer before the noon congregational prayer and two cycles afterwards. Two cycles before the afternoon prayer, two cycles after the evening prayer and two cycles after the night prayer. Sometimes during the prayer it appeared that he was looking around him out of the corner of his eyes. Indeed, he sometimes saw what was happening behind him as if it were in front of him. Then he led prayers. When he led prayers, men stood in rows behind him. Behind them stood the children, and behind the children stood the women. Sometimes he remained so long in prostration that he momentarily fell asleep from fatigue. He would get up and continue his prayers. Although sleep breaks and ablution, his eyes slept, but his heart did not sleep. He kept the fingers of his hands spread apart when he raised them at the beginning of Salat, and when he placed them on his knees, when he bent from the waist, and when he sat on his knees, but he held them tightly together when he pressed them on the floor next to his face during prostration. 
He raised his elbows so high so that one could see the white of his armpits. At the end of the formal prayers, during his private supplications, he prayed first for himself, then for those who were in urgent need. When he prayed for someone, his prayer affected not only that person, but his family, children and grandchildren as well. When he made his supplications, he opened his hands with palms facing his face. Sometimes he raised them high towards the heavens. When he finished supplicating, he wiped his palms over his face. On Friday, when he got up to preach at congregational prayers, he greeted people near him. When he climbed the pulpit, he turned his face to the congregation and saluted them. When he preached, he leaned over his staff. His face flushed, his eyes reddened, he raised his voice. He appeared wrathful, as if he were warning about imminent danger from an army, or as if he were ordering an army to attack the enemy. He would say, your night has turned into day. When he spoke to his warriors during battle, he leaned over his sword. When revelations came to him, he would bow his head low, as if a heavy load were on his neck. He would appear crushed. Once he received a revelation, while mounted on a camel, the knees of the camel gave out. Even when it was cold, drops of sweat like pearls would roll down his forehead. The colour of his face would change. A strange sound like buzzing of many bees would emanate from around his face. He would have terrible headaches, and they would put henna on his head to alleviate the pain. His passing. He left this world at the age of 63 in the city of Medina to which he had migrated ten years earlier. His last words were, Jalalu Rabbi Rafi Fakad Balagat, and then he gave up his blessed soul. His last advice to us was, Do not ever abandon prayer, do not ever abandon prayer, do not ever abandon prayer, and fear Allah in your treatment of those under your control. May the true and intended meaning of these words find its place in your hearts. May they paint an image in your heart's eye that is the best shape and form imaginable. May you feel as close to that image as a child to the most beneficent of fathers. Yet this intimacy should not make us suppose that he is like us. Is a chip of stone the same as a diamond, even though they are both rocks? Are the sun and a candle the same because they both shed light? May we see his real shape in this life, when our souls become light and soar to the heavens in our dreams. In following his path, in imitating his character, may we be worthy to gather under his banner on the day of judgment. May we receive the intercession of the one whom Allah sent as a mercy upon the universe. May we be blessed to love him and Allah more than everything else. May we find Allah's pleasure and grace and enter paradise. All blessings and salutations of Allah be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad, whose soul he created from the divine light of his essence, whom he has made a mirror of his beautiful attributes, and whom he has sent as a mercy. And peace and blessings be upon the members of his household, his family, his descendants, and his companions and helpers, and the saints of all those who carry his light. Amen. That is it for today. Can I please thank Roz Khan for narrating these two episodes? Like I said in the previous episode, these are some of my favourite episodes thus far, and may Allah reward you for it. Jazakallah khair, Roz Khan. For our listeners, please do leave a five-star rating at Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen. And also remember to share the podcast with your family and friends. This is a wonderful resource for people who do not have time to read. We are on all the major podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Deezer, Podbean, amongst others. And we are also on YouTube as a voice-only channel. Do join our Islamic Audio Bytes community on Facebook and Instagram. If you'd like to contact us directly, please do so at islamicaudiobytes at gmail.com. Otherwise, God willing, hope your day is full of goodness. Assalamu alaikum.